I am so excited. I'm sitting here with Jason Euler. Thanks for joining us today on episode 19 of the Setup Podcast, Jason. Sydney, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be on. Um, really glad we got to connect and make this happen. Yes, I am very happy about it. So I have to start it with, is it true that you played professional baseball before you started your career in music? Yes, I had about a 20-year baseball career from age three all the way to 23. Um, I was in the St. Louis Cardinals organization in 2016, ended up jumping into sales afterwards and eventually found my passion for music. Very cool. We all have a journey that leads us to exactly where we need to be. So what was that transition like then going from sports to sales to music? Yeah. Um, so I, I finished up with baseball in August of 2016 and I moved back to Arizona. I got a job at a startup tech company based out of Silicon Valley and I was an account executive there in their sales department um, selling technology to different businesses and restaurants across the country. Um, I really thought I got there and I'm like, oh, this is cool. You know, I'll find a career ladder here. I can climb up. I'll make six figures here eventually and probably go on to lead a good corporate life. Um, well, end of September comes and there's this music festival called Matt Decent Block Party here in Arizona. And a bunch of my friends are convinced me, like, you got to buy tickets, you should go. And I'm like, I had never really listened to dance music. I honestly didn't have that great of an impression of it. And I was very reluctant to go. Um, so my friends all talked me into it. They ended up getting a big group. The pregame ended up being at my house. I think that's why they really wanted to convince me. Um, <laughs> You're the one with the big house. <laughs> yeah, I, I had the house for the pregame and I was closest to the venue where the oh. festival was at. So um, it made sense and I ended up going and I had the time of my life. I had so much fun that I actually got lost from my group of friends because I was wandering around talking to strangers and making new friends um, that I lost my friends in the night and they had to go home. So I was trapped at the festival without a ride home and I woke up the next day and I paid $85 for an Uber to get home. Um, and that's actually kind of what led me to getting in the music world because the next festival I went into, um, I rented a party bus for $500 and it was a 60 passenger bus. Uh, and I only budgeted thinking I'd get like 30 friends to go. I ended up having 75 people on the bus. We had a huge pregame at my house. I made like $2,000. And I wasn't trying to make money from my friends. You know, I was just trying to solve my transportation problem. Um, so I'm like, and I didn't want to Venmo everyone back because that just sounded like a pain. So I, I'm like, hey, can we donate the money? Here's my connection at Phoenix Children's Hospital. Here's a receipt. Everyone was cool with it. And then that night at the end of the festival, we get off the bus and someone goes, what about the next party bus for decadence? And then the light bulb went off and I made my first event company at 3 a.m. in the morning after my second festival ever. <laughs> What part of being an athlete prepared you for working in the music industry? Oh, wow. It's a great question, actually, because I always pull so many things. Um, you know, getting to the point where you're playing baseball at a very, very high competitive level, um, the only guys that are there are either you have a ton of God-given talent or you are literally working every single day all the time. Um, I wasn't good enough to play as long as I did, and I'll be the first person to tell a lot of people that. Um, I was the guy that would stay two hours after practice. I was the guy that would show up an hour early to practice. Um, I, would, I was doing two days in the weight room. Um, you know, I would get conditioning and stay after, do extra reps. Um, you know, if some guy stayed after and ran six sprints, I'd stay after and run eight. Um, you know, and I really just transitioned that mindset to working in the music because it, it's just as competitive. Um, you know, even looking at our company, like Relentless Beats, we have 12 full-time employees and we put on festivals for 25,000 people. Um, and, and it's just about doing the little things every day for baseball, stretching, running, lifting, doing extra drills. For music, it was writing emails, DMing other people and connecting. Um, it was pushing and promoting shows and events and, and everything. But it was just little daily, uh, you know, consistencies that amassed over a long period of time and eventually compounded into a really great result where I ended up getting to work in the music industry full time. Yeah. Um, you know, the one thing that helped me with sales and just promoting shows and baseball, you know, for baseball as a hitter, I could fail seven out of 10 times, hit 300. And you're a hall of famer if you hit 300 for your career, which means you can fail 70% of the time and be considered one of the best. So I, for my entire life, I played a sport that taught me how to deal with failure. So when I got to business in the music world, and then I started, I failed tons. I failed so many times. Um, but I was always one failure closer to a success. 
So instead of being discouraged that I failed, I would be encouraged because I knew one, I was one more try away yeah. from being successful. Do you have like a specific example of like maybe a failure that you, that has happened to you and like what it transformed into? You know, my first, my first business was a failure. Um, I had to rebrand. I had a business partner where we ended up getting into it. I didn't have an operating mm -hmm. agreement in place after we filed an LLC because no one taught me in school that how to file an LLC or how to get an operating agreement or how to do a trademark. That's where the education system failed me. Um, and that was a big learning experience. Um, and it went all the way through there. Uh, another famous example is uh, we did a show in March of 2018 called Bay City Block Party. Um, going into the show, I took a, a $10,000 loan. I took a, a $10,000 out of my savings and I took the pink slip out on my car and I took a loan against it for $9,000. And I took 29 grand oh and I God. put it into the entire show um, and two days before the event was supposed to happen, it got canceled by the city. Um, and what had happened was I partnered with this bar that was going to extend the block out onto the streets through the block. So the GM was supposed to get the fencing, the railing, the porta potties, the fire marshals, the EMTs, the police, all the permitting. And then my job was to talent buy, build the stage and promote the show. Well, the GM of the venue goes MIA two days before the event. I did my end, but it turns out he didn't do anything. So I had 48 hours to figure it out. So I had to go to beg the city. They gave me one last chance and they're like, you have 48 hours to get the fencing, the fire marshal, security, EMT, all of that. Um, I took two days sick out of my corporate job so I could get away. Thursday, Friday, I worked straight and got everything done just in time for the Saturday show that started at 12 o'clock noon. And uh, showing that went off without a hitch, we had probably over 3,000 to 4,000 people. Um, it was an incredible, incredible experience. You know, I, I, w I went through some really hard things due to lack of experience. Um, honestly, I was very ignorant um, coming into the music industry. I, I didn't realize how tough it was. And like, that honestly kind of played to my favor because I was so naive. Mm -hmm. um, but that's why I created the Artist Path, um, which we're actually rebranding into Connect um, right now. And, you know, that online plat platform from all these people in the music industry to where they can share their experience, you know. The, the thought process on creating the business was if I could go back and talk to my 23, my 24 year old self and tell him what I know now, I'd have saved him money. I'd have saved him time. I'd have saved him heartache. Um, you know, so that knowledge is just so valuable. And I was lucky enough to where I had three mentors who really shaped me mm -hmm. and I would not be working in the music industry without them hands down. Um, you know, so it's now I have an obligation and a responsibility to take the things I've learned and pass them on to the next person who wants to work for it and really has that dream in their heart to, to work in music. So I have a duty there. So give us a little bit more details about Artist Path, Artist Path Turning Connect. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I ended up partnering with um, one of my mentors, Brandon Owen, who started White Rabbit Group in Southern California and then eventually went to work up at Paradiso and USC up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and he's just done a lot of great things. He's been around music forever and knew a lot of people. Um, so I brought him on as one of the first mentors and then he had a session and he goes, Hey, we know a lot of people in the music industry. We should get everyone on this, especially cause Hey, COVID just hit. Um, all the people in the music industry are at home with no work and everyone's stuck inside. So, you know, why not create this? Um, and so we went right on to the artist path and, uh, as we started going, we're like, you know, what, what could we potentially change this name to, to where we could just do mentorship for everything as we scale across. And um, we eventually landed on the name Connect because um, that's exactly what we're here to do. We're here to break down that boundary and connect you with the experts um, in the music industry and abroad uh, for the things you really want to learn about. That's also something that is strong, that I strongly believe in, that's really close to heart because mm -hmm. I'm so new to the music industry and, and that's one of the reasons why, like, when I transitioned, mm -hmm. I, I feel like you just kind of have to like roll with it. Like, Absolutely. um, and I came across so many amazing people and you don't necessarily find them online. Like you would anyone else on LinkedIn or anything like that. So yeah. this is just an awesome platform to get people connected. Even um, if it's not through our site, I mean, you know, I met some of my mentors through DMS, 
through email, just through mutual things I was working around. Like, you know, you don't need to go pay for it, but you need to find a mentor if you want to make it in music. And I'm very mm-hmm. adamant about that um, because there's, it doesn't matter what school, what textbook or anything you've read. Um, you need to go talk to someone who's done it, learn how they failed, learn how they corrected their actions and figure it out from there. It, when you were starting off, was it easy to find a mentor, like, or was it a little bit hard for people to share very like hard. their secrets? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's very it's very hard because you can't just go to someone and say, "Hey, give me this value. Just give me, give me, give me." Um, it doesn't come off right. And there's there's a lot of kids that do approach it that way. Unfortunately, I get a lot of DMs where, "Hey, you know, how do I do X, Y, and Z here and this?" And you know, she's like, "Teach me and tell me." And like, dude, I'm a person. Like, say hi. <laughs> You know, let's, right. let's, let's form a relationship. Like, you know, I'm happy to work with kids. And like I said, I have a duty to pass forward the things I've learned, but I, I want to do it for people who actually care and aren't just self-centered and making it about themselves. We're right. a music community. We're a music community. I want to really find someone I can help. That's going to really work hard and, and just do it instead of just looking for a handout. So, you know, when you first started your business, did you have it in mind that you wanted to be acquired by another company or at that time, what was your goal? Um, at that time, I just want, I loved the music. I just wanted to throw shows. I wanted to be involved. Um, the funny thing was I went to that second festival where I ran the first party bus. Um, and I actually emailed Relentless Beats and tried to get in touch to sell tickets to the show. So I could, um, you know, if you sell enough tickets, you'd get a free one. And that's all Mm -hmm. I wanted to do. Um, I never got an email back. Um, so I said, okay, well, I'll just run the party buses and I'll make money there and pay for my ticket that way. Um, and then eventually I saved up enough money from the party buses. I'm like, I could just rent a venue and hire a headliner. And I'm like, there we go. So I rented a venue, hired a headliner. We sold out our first show at Shady Park, which is one of the most famous spots in, uh, in Arizona dance music. And uh, from there, and that was in December of 2017. And then in 2018, we did 65, 70 events that year. Um, so yeah, I was just go, go, go. I was looking for events wherever I could take them. I was trying to take the brand everywhere I could to really create the image and make it look bigger. Um, and and that's the thing about business and just music in general is you can create a lot of perception because people aren't going to spend the time to really go dig the details. You really got to create a perception that you, you, whatever you have is in demand. Um, and we got really good at doing that. And as we created that perception, that perception started to fulfill and actually ended up did have a lot of, did have a lot of demand. So then how did you get the attention from Relentless Beats? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. Uh, you know, so it was, it's a tight market here in Arizona. Relentless Beats has been around for like 15, 20 years. Um, they were doing all the big festivals, all the big shows, booking top headliners. The CEO there had been talent buying since you know before Skrillex and Porter Robinson were even really getting going um so I had a talent buy against them and I lost a lot of bids on artists and there were artists that would not work with me purely out of loyalty to them um but there were holes in the market and the thing about being the small guy in the market is you can pivot and you can move quicker than the big guy um so they threw a dubstep show I'd throw a house show they throw a house show I'd throw a dubstep show um you know so I found the holes in the market where they were going they didn't provide transportation to their festivals I found a hole there, um, you know, so I found my lanes and opportunities and then I doubled down on them. Um, and, you know, eventually I started making offers on a lot of the same talent they were doing. And when you have two offers on a certain artist, that just starts driving up the price in the market. Right. On top of that, my company is ticket, selling tickets. So I'm taking money out of the market. Um, you know, so eventually I, I caused enough noise to where, um, you know, we sat down and talked and, um, eventually that discussion led into them acquiring me and then offering me a full-time position, uh, on the team over there. And so I made the leap. Did they approach you or did yeah, you? They, okay. They, I, I approached early, early on, like in 2016 at the end, right when I first got into festivals to sell tickets, never heard back. Um, I tried to set up official party buses and just didn't work out on details, um, then finally in December of 2018, they reached out and we had a meeting, sat through Christmas and New Year's Eve festival. And then, uh, about the beginning of January of 2019 is when we started to structure the deal and what it would look like, um, for them to acquire me. And then I was full time there in February and have been since. And I manage, uh, four artists, uh, along with our artist management roster. So All I under a few, the few different, yeah, a few different, a few different hats. Wow, you must be busy. <laughs> I, uh, I don't like to sit still. <laughs> wow, it's so incredible to 
like see someone's journey like that. And I think like even looking back, like in this conversation, it's it's just wild to see where people can go. It was an insane couple of years, but I mean, if you really want something and you're willing to wake up every day and just move the needle a little bit further toward getting to it, it, you know, it's, it's those days when I'm tired and I, Hey, I don't want to do this. It's just saying you're going to count to three and you're going to go get it done. Um, and, and there were days where I, I was exhausted, but I knew I could not take my foot off the gas. Mm-hmm. And, and especially in the music world, it's all about staying consistent and relevant and top of mind. That's why these artists are posting every day on Instagram. They're feeding the Spotify algorithms so they can constantly stay at the top of mind. You take your foot off the gas a little bit, you know, you'll set yourself back and you'll have to catch up on that work. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I was able to go from September, 2016, not knowing a thing about dance music to February, 2019 to working full time in it. I did not take my foot off the gas between those two periods. Yes. Um, that is a perfect way to put it. Cause I feel like a lot of people don't want to put in the work. It's either it falls in your lap or you do something that's a little bit easier. Um, and a strength trainer in college said, everybody want to be famous, but nobody want to work for it. Yeah. <laughs> So like what attracted you to the artists that you manage just knowing that mm-hmm. there are, you know, like tens of millions of others out there. Yeah. Um, with Steven, I, I, he sent me over the music and at the time when I first met him, he was producing a completely different mm-hmm. genre than what he produces now. Um, but I just heard the quality and production and I saw this kid, I'm like, he's 19. Um, you know, I started asking about his musical backgrounds. Like I've been playing piano since I was three. Um, you know, he's like, I've been producing since I was 15. So he already had four years under his belt and I'm like, he's young and he's studying music at Arizona state. So, um, all these things. And and on top of that, he, he's just one of the nicest, most humble human beings you will ever meet. Um, you know, it's one thing to work, like it's one thing to be able to work with a good artist. It's another thing to work with a great person. Um, and, and I'm really lucky to say that all the artists I work with are great people. Uh, and, and that's the biggest thing in this industry. Um, regardless of your skill sets, talent or whatever, if your character's not up to par, you're not going to go far. Um, you know, so I, I, that's a big thing I like to consider is, you know, what's this person's character and integrity? Yeah. Um, that's funny. Like there's this saying in Nashville, um, that both the people that I've had on previous episodes from Nashville have mentioned. Um, it's like the art of being a good hang. Like, you yeah. know, a, a bunch of other people can do exactly what you do, but what sets you apart is actually being a good person and mm-hmm. actually want, like people want to be around you. Um, Absolutely. And the, and the biggest thing that really helped with keeping those relationships strong, like especially working in partnerships and sponsorships with festivals, working with artists, um, the number one thing I've learned and has always been just a staple is under promise and over deliver every single time. Um, you know, like don't sit there and talk about what you're going to do all these things, you know, find those little extra areas where you can go take the extra step. Um, and that's another lesson I learned from baseball. My uh, baseball coach said, you know, if you ever go to the Sistine Chapel, he said, everyone's sitting there looking at the ceiling and how beautiful the painting is. And he's like, if you walk over to the side of the walls, there's these little carvings of little flowers just etched into the wood. He goes, yeah, that's cool. But I want to meet the guy who did that because that's part of what brings the overall aesthetic and everything together. The ceiling's great, but it's the detail. Mm -hmm. Um, So whenever you have that little extra bit to go and you can make that detail better, do it, especially when it's for someone else other than yourself. So do you have like a specific strategy that you use uh, while developing these artist careers? Yeah, I mean, every artist is unique. It's a matter of where they come in. Like um, Ekanova, we launched a project from scratch. Bella Renee, we're launching a project from scratch. You know, Rel, already played Coachella, Tomorrowland, EDC, Tyson, uh, Tidy, already played every uh, continent in the, in the globe, pretty much minus Antarctica. Um, you know, so for Tyson, you know, Tidy taking that project on it's, Hey, you know, how can we connect you to a millennial audience? You know, how do we connect you to these Gen Z kids? You know, cause the people that were listening to you back in 2011, 2012, they're 30, they probably have kids. I don't know how many more festivals they're going to, mm-hmm. um, you know, so take we their really kids gotta, to the festival. <laughs> exactly. You know, so we're, we're going to revamp the image of the brand and we're going to attack it with a new strategy. We're going a different direction to more modernize the music now to fit today's uh, generation. Uh, Rel, you know, he's a Jersey club pioneer and it, for him, it's really about promoting the culture of Jersey where they come from. And it's a very niche genre in electronic dance music, but 
Um, they have a very strong, loyal fan base. So for him, it's about staying loyal, really being a pioneer, continuing to progress that genre and take this Jersey club from a small area of the United States mm -hmm. and take it to a massive scale to introduce it to everyone. Um, you know, a, a lot of the Asian countries love Jersey club music. He was doing a lot of shows in South Korea, Japan, Thailand, China. So he, he went and played all that uh, pre-COVID. So, you know, we're, we're progressing, we're progressing a sound there. Uh, Bella strategy, uh, you know, I, I talk about this a lot in my mentorship sessions. Uh, I call it the slushy strategy. Uh, one of the big things for artists I recommend kicking off at the gate is doing a remix in an original for every month for about five to six months straight before you even think about releasing on a record label. Just start releasing, get the feedback on the music, show that you can be consistent and figure out how to stream your music and get good streaming numbers. And once you do that, record labels will come find you. Do you have like a strategy to like, for, so what about for um, Echo Nova, who is mm -hmm. like, when you first started with him, when he was like first starting out, doesn't really know the audience. How do you start discovering who your audience is? Uh, you know, it, it's putting stuff out into the market and well, with the music, first off, you know, we started sending it to people who we, we trusted our friends close and, you know, you get their feedback. Hey, this is really good. I like that sound. Hey, maybe I don't like this, you know? You know, it's the same thing as like Taco Bell. They're not gonna come up with a new menu item and just throw it on the menu. They're gonna put it into a focus group. Um, so very much of the same of building a brand, you know, get the immediate feedback from people whose opinions you trust and are gonna support you. Um, get that feedback, take it back to the lab, tweak it a bit, come back out with more. Um, you know, and eventually the music just started, you know, we just started releasing music and, you know, we were sharing it with our friends, we were sharing it locally and it, it caught on. You know, when an artist is starting out and they may not like have like money, are there any like tips um, that like maybe I started? Yeah, I started Octave with five hundred dollars and a party bus and then a line of credit. So you know, if you don't have any money, that's like the first thing I'm gonna tell everyone. Um, you know, one thing I did, I needed more money to throw shows to get bigger artists. I would go to garage sales on Saturdays and Sundays buy things cheap and go flip them on Facebook marketplace. Everyone's got an iPhone and everyone's got a car. So for anyone that tells me like, Oh, I don't have enough money. I'm like, no, you're just lazy. Um, <laughs> you know, like there, there's always a way to get money. They print more and more of it every day. There's always a way to go get it. Um, but you know, with economic was simple, every single booking, we took that money and invested it right back into the project. Um, you know, and even if you're getting local bookings, you know, you're making 50 to $150 in some markets, you know, to, to DJ a bar for a night, like, Go do that, you know, heck, go do yard work. I don't know. But, um, you know, if you want, if you, if your why is big enough for why you want to do something yeah. and the purpose you have behind it, you'll figure out anyhow. Do you only get paid when artists get paid, essentially? Uh, um, most, I mean, every manager works out a different deal with their artists. Uh, most work on percentages. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a direct deal on bookings or, you know, certain things. Most management day these days does what's called a 360 deal where they make a percentage off merch, touring, everything mm -hmm. 360 with the project. Um, you know, then a lot of managers and these management companies are now managing, you know, five, six, seven, ten 10 artists, whatever. Um, and that's how they're functioning in those companies working with you know, larger scale of artists. Is there a specific tip that you have for like the Instagram algorithm? I feel like that um, was the hardest. The, the biggest thing I, I tell I, all my artists, I don't care about Instagram likes. I don't care about engagement on photos. I don't care about engagement on tweets. I, I think getting, that's a result. You know, getting a lot of likes on a page is a result. Uh, you know, a lot of people following on Twitter, that's a result. Um, I like to focus on the process. Hey, did we create good content? Did we post a good song? Did we take a good picture at that show? Um, let's focus on the process. And eventually if you do the process every single day, the result will be there in the long run. Again, consistency and persistency. It's not just one Instagram photo that's going to blow you up. It's having a schedule of photos throughout the year. Um, the other thing that most people overlook that you can do for free instead of buying ads, go comment on other people's stuff. Go leave a nice, genuine, heartfelt comment on someone else's stuff. They're going to see that they're going to feel valued when you can make someone else feel valued about themselves. They're naturally more times than not going to come back and reciprocate that value. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't, you don't do that with the intention of getting it because again, getting that value back as a result, we're focusing on the process. 
Um, so any artists, yeah, go leave your two cents on 90 Facebook or 90 Instagram posts throughout the day of genuine solid feedback. I do that every day for a week and watch what happens. Do it every day for a month and watch what happens. Um, yeah, other than absolutely. that, learn how, to buy, learn how to buy ads and feed the business that is Facebook. That's also something that I actually like to tell like, fellow content creators, and I think it translates into musicians as well, is like, you know, find the musicians that you have a similar sound to or who you aspire to or have similar music and um, literally comment on the, their followers' yeah. picture. You know, just knowing how most musicians make money, you know, touring mm. and, you know, just a whole live experience as well with all of those of being postponed or canceled how have, what have you been doing um, and what has your artist been doing um, during this time? Yeah, definitely. Um, with Relentless Beats, um, you know, we, we jumped right away, started doing the live streams, getting into that. That was really popular at the beginning of COVID. I think the live streams are kind of fizzled out. People are like kind of meh on it now. It's starting to seem. Uh, same with my artists. They were playing a bunch before, um, you know, Econo, we did an entire stay at home uh, schedule, you know, where it was a live stream this day, a podcast this day. Uh, he made a sample pack from sounds around his house. Like he was cutting potatoes, opening the blinds, and he took all those sounds and he made a song out of it. Um, and then he gave out the sample pack to other producers. So, you know, we're, we're getting creative with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, with Real Lives Beats, we did four drive-in uh, events. We did mm -hmm. uh, Friday, Saturday with Carnage. And then we did a, another Friday, Saturday weekend with Seven Lions, Drezzo, Wooly. For like the drive-in festival, like how far in advance do you guys start planning for that? So the first one, we started planning like two, three weeks in advance and just like sent it and figured it out and pulled it off. Um, luckily, you know, the venue we work with that hosts our festivals, we have a very, very close relationship with, um, you know, once we had a plan and we were able to put the mechanics together, you know, executing it, um, you know, we have, we have enough people and, um, mm. procedures in place where that's not hard for us. Yeah. So it was pretty, it was pretty smooth flowing overall, honestly. That's good to hear. Do you need like permits and insurance and all that? Oh yeah. Uh, insurance <laughs> is a big one right now. And, uh, you know, a lot of the reason, even if things do open up, you won't see these festivals returning is one, I don't think any of them are going to be able to afford the insurance, uh, that is going to come with, uh, everything. Oh, wow. That's one of the things, like, even if things open up, you know, the insurance premiums are going to be so high, like that could be a bar from people from hosting a festival, unless you're Live Nation or Insomniac or one of these big companies that can fund it. That's, that's really interesting. I even think about that. That mm -hmm. really is like survival of the fittest at that point. Yeah, exactly. Um, so how have you, so what have you been doing? Have you been working from home? Um, since uh, home? Yeah, I've been working from home since March. Um, you know, quarantine hit, uh, we launched Artist Path and really got going on that. So that's been something that's really kept me busy. Um, you know, all my artists were still releasing music and doing things along that line and recording music and um, all that. You know, I, I'm not pushing as hard on the socials and branding right now um, mm -hmm. with my acts. It's just where their respective projects are at. Um, right. The bigger artists, you know, Tidy Route, we got to stay on top of things a little more and a little more consistent because they already have a global um, image and we got to stay connected at that level. Our industry is going to look completely different by the time this is over. Um, artist fees are going to be different. Um, the way promoters and contracts work out is all going to be different and new. So it was a reset that our industry realistically needed. Um, it mm -hmm. just came in a very abrupt, harsh way. Right. Do you, um, do you have anything um, in particular that you think is going to change because of COVID? Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, one thing Live Nation put out a memo and said, you know, a lot of artists aren't going to get these guarantees now, you know, uh, in typical booking process, pretty much all the risk and liability falls on the promoter. Um, you know, the word promoter is going to get hit the hardest if they don't sell the show or don't sell enough mm -hmm. tickets. Artists were getting these guarantees regardless of how the shows were doing. Um, so now these guarantees are going to probably change up down the road. Like I said, fees are going to be a lot lower. Um, but I, I do expect our industry to catapult when it comes back. Um, mm -hmm. I think you keep people inside this long and a year away from festivals. Uh, I think we're going to see record numbers in the entertainment industry coming out of this. So it's a matter of gritting our teeth, helping each other out and uh, holding on till then, honestly. Oh, cool. Yeah. So is there anything else you would like to share with us? Any last words? 
<laughs> um, no, you know, I'm really grateful just for being on here today. And, you know, it's always a, a really a pleasure when I get to come share my story and kind of talk about the things that um, I did in the music industry, just for anyone listening to this, you know, my DMs are open, you know, check me out on social media. It's at Jason Euler, MGMT. Uh, other than that, all my projects, pretty much, whether it's Moon Landing, Artist Path, Relentless Beats, and my artists can all be found on my website, which is just jasonuler.ventures. Um, just thank you and really, really grateful to have been on this. Oh, thank you for your time and kind words. And yes, I'm so happy we were able to do this. I always love having these types of conversations. Um, that's the exciting part for me because this is like my way of learning about different parts of the it's industry great, that I- It's a I, great way to do it. Yes, and it's it's really great just to meet people like you um, who and give you the platform to share your experiences um, mm -hmm. because I don't think there's enough people talking about the behind the scenes, you know what I mean? Like people yeah. just focus on the final product or the artists and they don't really realize what, all the effort and time and it's, teams and, and that go like into it. Earlier, it's, it's about the process, you know, the results great and everything, but what's make, what makes everything beautiful is the process. Mm -hmm.